SpaceX Fall Investigations. Starlink Potential Killer? Starship 26 is ready for static fire. SpaceX is asking federal regulators to correct a report that suggests the company Starlink satellite constellation could pose grave risks to people on Earth. The full analysis does acknowledge that SpaceX says its Starlink satellites fully burn up in the atmosphere when they fall back to Earth at the end of service, posing no increased risk of striking people, airplanes, or infrastructure. It's high time again. Starship 26 test campaign continues. Raptor Ignition Starbase, another Starship stack. SpaceX gets angry with the fog. Now the questions are, will Starlink harm people? What about Starlink's potential killer? When the Starship 26 is expected to be ready for static fire? Hi guys, we here again with an amazing video for all of you. But before starting the video, if you are new to our channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you will never miss an update. Let's dive into the video. 26. SpaceX's is the strangest creation or it stands out from the rest of the Starship lineup. Let's clear that real quick. This prototype is especially devoid of flaps and fully misses the heat guard. A proposition floating around suggests that maybe this model is an expendable ship interpretation solely for satellite deployment. Is that true, however? Then is the catch. It lacks a cargo bay, so it's not planting anything anytime soon. Another proposition is that Starship 26 might be designated for tasks like a Starship tanker or an in-route fuel transfer vehicle. Starship tanker does, in fact, sound instigative. Still, given that this prototype does not come with bigger internal tanks and considering the significance of reusability for tankers, this doesn't seem very certain. So, what's my bet? This prototype was drafted to test out the in-route fuel transfer process. They have to do it at some point for NASA's Human Landing System program, and with a fully naked vehicle, it's one thing lower to worry about after its charge is done. SpaceX may just let it burn up in the atmosphere. On the other hand, it may turn out that after all ground tests, this ship will just be scrapped. After all, SpaceX is not particularly novelettish about its ready-for-flight prototypes. Rewinding to February, the testing saga of Ship 26 began. Back also, it was deposited on suborbital pad A and later passed two cryogenic tests. One involves a partial filler of both the liquid oxygen and methane tanks, and the other a partial filler of just the LOX tank. Following these tests, Ship 26 was moved to the rocket garden for machine fitting. Still, the orbital launch failure redounded in quite a reversal in its return to the launch point. It took until September for the vehicle to be returned paving the way for further tests a month later. On October 9th, Trace 4 was closed off by the sheriff. Following the typical pad clearing procedure, the suborbital tank ranch began its venting routine. This is always the first step. See, it indicates that the cooling process of the installation has begun. It's a medication too is suitable to fuel the prototype. Not long after, a frosty ring became visible on the main liquid oxygen tank. This was fleetly followed by frost appearing on the tidal tank. Wow, decelerate down Felix, what's a tidal tank? For those strange with the term, allow me to explain. Most ordinary rockets generally boast two tanks per stage, one designated for energy and another for oxidizer. But Starship is anything but an ordinary rocket designed for full reusability. Within its upper stage, there's an array of four energy tanks, not two. Starting from the base, there is the primary liquid oxygen tank, followed by the main liquid methane tank. At the top, nestled within the nose cone, like two fresh lower tidal tanks. These tidal tanks live to break a pivotal problem during a starship's descent through the atmosphere. Commodity traditional upper stages nowadays do. As the starship makes its return trip to Earth, its energy tanks are nearly depleted. Due to graveness during the belly bomb initiative, any remaining energy clings to the tank side walls due to the exposure of the ship. This would be a huge problem for the machines, as without a source of energy, they wouldn't be suitable to fire up, causing the whole thing to smash right into the ground. To help this, SpaceX introduced tidal tanks. They're not used for the launch, so they're still filled when the Starship comes down again. Accordingly, this prevents any energy sloshing during the ship's vertical descent. A fairly simple, yet genius result. Now that you understand the part of a tidal tank, hopefully you see why it's so important to test it before the launch. 
Without these tanks, the wharf is off the table. For Ship 26 still, these are doubtful to be used. No heat guard, no problem. Following the test, on October 9th, posterior, road closures were cancelled. But this is where it gets intriguing. Cameron County blazon new bones for October 12th, 13th, and 16th. By the time you are watching this, Ship 26 might have either experienced another test or is just gearing up for one. We'll show the result then, if it happens. With the original focus on the lock side of effects, SpaceX might have tested both the main and tidal tanks for the methane side next. The test sequence should involve a spin high and crown in a grand static fire, with all six Raptor machines kindling at formerly. We are auspicious that SpaceX will, in their usual style, share footage of this corner on X, hopefully slipping some light on the purpose of this prototype. While the prospect of a static fire is instigative, the real buzz, of course, revolves around Starship's alternate flight. Expectation is at 11 as we await the modified launch permit. Launch permit. An awful combination of words. Grounded on former information from the Federal Aviation Administration, it seems we're simply days, or at most, many weeks down from its publication. By the time it releases, the alternate mound should be ready to launch, but for now, it isn't. As anticipated on October 9th, the hot staging ring was formerly again taken down. They might have just piled it again for the Cybertruck commercial. Another nice side effect, if not every single step costs millions of bones. Given the effectiveness of the SpaceX platoon, formerly all demanded fixes are applied. Reassembling the entire setup can be fulfilled in bare hours. Progress also remains loyal at the Orbital Tank Farm, where Starbase masterminds are busy integrating the recently installed subcooters and pumps. This upgrades thing to have the time it takes to fuel unborn starships, bringing it down to the 45. 45 nanosecond mark for 4,600 tons of energy. That's more than 100 tons per nanosecond. Makes you see these pumps with different eyes, right? The tank ranch won't be of important use without the coming lineup of prototypes. And for that, our focus shifts to the figure point. The first step is the highway, the construction mecca where SpaceX is assembling starships. Presently, this mammoth structure harbors two prototypes, Ship 30 and Ship 31. Ship 30, deposited to the right, saw its assembly completed in late August, followed by expansive internal work. On October 9th, through the lens of our shooter, John, we witnessed this prototype crop from the high bay. Was it moved for testing? Not yet, it was simply dislocated. A necessary equivocation given the high bay space constraints. It's paving the way for posterior flaps installation. During its brief appearance, we spotted an intriguing change compared to its precursor, Ship 29. Are any true Starship experts around? Let's test it. Notice anything different? Pause and partake in your answer in the commentary. No infidelity. All right. Ready for the reveal? This particular ship doesn't sport the nose cone antennas used for telemetry transmissions back to the ground. Rather, these were moved and are now nestled beneath the cargo bay. Clustered together. Maybe they're just easier to integrate this way. Since its return, Ship 30 was equipped with one of its flaps standing by for the second. When ready, its coming trip probably leads to Massey's for some stress testing. So for Ship 31, the one positioned to the left wing, its mounting concluded on October 3rd. Another bone is done. Bonkers. This marks a 34-day period from its commencement to completion. To give you a point of reference, Ship 30's assembly goes a bare 28 days. While Ship 31 took a fresh six days, the speed of construction remains possibly quick. There simply isn't another company in the world that can produce rockets this fast. Not indeed taking the size into account. In the front of the high bay lies the ring yard, the temporary resting place where sections of starships await their turn for mounding. Then you'll find parts designated for Booster 13 as well as the posterior section of Ship 34. 34. What captures our interest the most is the recently spotted nose cone for Ship 32. Nose cones are generally the first part done for prototype construction at the Starbase. This suggests that work on Ship 32 is imminent. Behind the ring yard stands potent Mega Bay. Although SpaceX might be in the process of adding a VAB type sliding door to shield vital factors from dust, for now, our view inside remains unchecked and crystal clear. In typical SpaceX style, the interior is like an ant's nest. 
hosting a party for four super heavy boosters. Supporter 11 is presently partying at the hinder end of the Mega Bay, while Booster 10 claims its place on the cotillion bottom, the new machine installation platform. Once it's removed from this stage, it should be Raptor time. Let's give it 33 brand new Raptor V2 machines. We're not done. Supporter 12 sits in expectation of its forthcoming cryo tests, and Booster 13 is growing week by week. Presently, its LOX tank is missing only the posterior section. Upon its completion, we anticipate to see the construction of the methane tank. Four super heavy boosters in the channel in the not so distant future. Construction of new prototypes will also protest off at the alternate mega bay, adding capabilities further. The top sun deck subcast of this bay is nearing completion. Given the recent delivery of two ground crane trolleys, it's only a matter of time before we can see the installation of the quintet of grinders, which will serve as tracks for these trolleys. It's over at the Star Factory. Rapid fire progress is apparent. The cladding for the structure's alternate phase has been completely put in place, and the posterior section is nearly entirely accountered with penstocks. It's starting to look fancy. Completion of the first Nosicone product member is anticipated in just a few weeks. With the mid-bay no longer being in the way, there is implicit for the Star Factory's expansion towards the left wing, surpassing the confines of the first phase. This could compensate for the area that was taken down on the structure's right side. SpaceX doesn't enjoy this little patch of lawn. It's crazy, I know. Let's go to the Sanchez point next. Eventually, there's some construction exertion centered around the ground fabrication building. Preliminarily, this structure had to be disassembled due to its hindrance to Star Factory's expansion. Now, after a period of silence, the wall cladding installation has commenced. While its precise function remains uncertain, in the history, it was primarily used for fabricating transport stands for boosters and vessels. Given SpaceX's implicit unborn demand for these days, it's presumptive that the structure will continue to serve its original purpose. Let me share a secret with you about how I manage largely work ferocious days. With a lately cooked and healthy mess from Factor, big thanks to Factor a part of the HelloFresh family for changing the game. When it comes to reflections at home, Factor has been a lifesaver for me. With their dietitian approved gourmet chef drafted reflections that are both succulent and ready in just two twinkles. No grocery shopping, no messy fix, and no remittal needed. As someone who is enjoying both HelloFresh and Factor, I cannot emphasize enough how these reflections have simplified and diversified my dining experience, especially with my packed schedule. Whether you are on keto, vegan, or just looking for protein-packed reflections, Factor's got you covered ready to dive into a world of delicious convenience. Factors giving the what about it, followership, a sweet deal for this month. Get 50 off your first box. Just head to factor75.com or hit the link in the description and use Law Felix 50 at checkout. Dive into a world of epicure convenience. Cheers to Factor for supporting the channel. Pilgrimaging to Massey's Test Point, our go-to place for the strangest of all prototypes, we find the unexpectedly normal Ship 29 witnessing yet another cryogenic test. With two tests formally carried out in September, a fresh one sounded doubtful. Yet on October 4th, both of Starship 29's tanks geared up for another round of testing, only for the fueling to come to an unforeseen halt. This abrupt stop could indicate either that it was just a really short test or that the commodity went awry and was abandoned. The testing procedure at Massey's is not your average cryogenic test. The ship test stand then boasts six thrust rams, three for bluffing the ocean, position raptors, and another three designated to emulate the vacuum-optimized machines. These thrust rams serve a pivotal part by plying force at the exact locales where a raptor machine would during a static fire or indeed factual flight. The intent is to replicate how the prototype might bear under similar conditions avoiding the threat of a massive explosion. Imagine a script where product excrescence in the posterior pate isn't spotted by quality control, only getting apparent upon plying pressure without thrust rams. Such an issue might only surface during a static fire with the prototype filled to the brim with fuel. And also rapid unscheduled disassembly is the result. Stylish case. The prototype is rendered unfit for flight. Worst case, the entire test stage is no longer usable. 
When employing thrust simulators, the worst implicit outgrowth is a slip of liquid nitrogen or oxygen at the test point. Much better. Same goes for the booster test stand located behind the ship stage. This one is armed with its own set of thrust rams, an aggregate of 13, emulating the center cluster of Raptors. Do you know how they test the external 20 machines? How are they dissembled? Meet the fabulous Can Crusher, cootered with an emotional 33 thrust simulator. It can mimic every single super heavy machine. We look forward to seeing Booster 12 witnessing some tortures using one of these biases soon. That came out wrong. Incipiently, John managed to snap some shots of ship 27's posterior section mounted within a structure known as the nose cone pen. This setup seeks to emulate peak dynamic pressure, regarded as one of the most grueling phases of the flight for any rocket. It remains a riddle whether this prototype has formally been tested. Any ideas as to why this prototype is here and not at the can crusher? Drop your thoughts in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to give our video a thumbs up if you liked the video.